Turn your neighbor, so. so. That's actually a German word. It's just that you put a Z on it, so. <laughs> Pastor Daniel will tell me if I'm lying. Uh, so, uh, my last session of today, today we've been learning about how to stand, let nothing move you. That's what we're going to be learning about. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, so tell your neighbor tomorrow, tomorrow I'll have a surprise guest. So, uh, yes, just like we did at the last gathering, I've got a surprise guest, somebody you're going to enjoy. So, tomorrow, wow, tomorrow, I'm even looking forward to it. It's going to be a phenomenal after, uh, day. So, we're going to have a surprise guest at some point during the day. Uh, but tomorrow, we'll be talking about, what's the next thing after you stand firm? Kingdom business. Somebody is awake. We're going to be learning kingdom business tomorrow. So that's what tomorrow is going to be about. So stand firm. Stand firm. You know, when God gave me this word, I really tried to understand it because it's not the word I expected. And I've spent time just like, okay, God, show me what this is. And I really, like I say, believe the world is changing and it's going to shake many. But God's people, remember the word from last year, the people who know they are God shall be strong and do exploits. So uh, let me just say, as Pastor Godwin said, if you get at some point sleepy or feel like you're succumbing, uh, feel free to just stand up, uh, walk to the side, walk to the place where there's wind crossing over. Uh, don't feel like you're constrained, you know. Uh, don't allow sleep to take over because I believe that the Holy Spirit is in the house and you don't want to miss what he is saying. So make sure you stand up and just take a walk if you need to and come back uh, and as you listen. So I'm going to just talk very quickly. I want to finish this one quickly. I want to talk about how to backslide proof your faith. How to backslide proof your faith. Remember, we've said, by God's grace, nobody in this room will backslide. None of us are going to lose our faith. None of us are going to get cold in our faith. None of us are going to get, become cool Christians who are not passionate for Jesus. That's not, tell your neighbor, that's not your portion. Yeah, that's not God's plan for any single one of us. So I believe the most important thing we must ask ourselves is how do I backslide proof my faith? I mean, it's, if, you're, if you're getting married, one of the questions you should always ask yourself is how do I divorce proof my marriage? Because the statistics are against you. Many couples are getting divorced who probably even knew God more than you do. So you need to ask yourself, how do we make sure we divorce-proof our marriage? We're not just going to become a statistic. And it's the same thing. How do you backslide-proof your faith? Uh, let me just uh, give a big shout-out to Pastor Mugisha and Diane from Kigali. <laughs> uh, they were flying in today, so they made their way, and I'm so glad to see, to see these cool people. By the way, this, this church is, I need to tell you, if you're in Mavuno, visit, like make it in your bucket list. Uh, visit these churches. Like, uh, come to the Kigali gathering this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you'll be blown away. Uh, come, make sure you're there for the, I know many of you have been to Kampala gathering. You need to go to Bujumbura gathering, let me tell you. There's nothing like it. Uh, you think you've been to a gathering, you haven't been to a gathering until you've been to a Burundi gathering. I mean, these guys know how to rock the house. I think music was invented in Congo and incubated in Burundi. Because, I mean, their music is just off the charts. And I know Kenyans, the problem with guys who live in Kenya, they think they know everything. <laughs> and I'm saying that because I'm one of them. Like, I used to think I knew everything until, I said, until the Lord took me out to Uganda and then after that to Burundi. I mean, it's, you start seeing things you've never seen and they humble you. You realize, oh my gosh, our God is a big God. And there are talents and gifts out there that you have no clue about. There are smart people out there doing incredible things. And so make it a point, at least uh, some of you are in business, plan to visit. I mean, these churches are just amazing, amazing places where brothers and sisters uh, like yourself, uh, they worship God. Can we just appreciate uh, all the diaspora campuses that are here uh, from different nations and all the ones. I mean, there's so many of you watching online as well, and we're grateful for that. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Wow. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. It's interesting because the scripture 
it, it tells us things. And many times you read those things, if you're really not reading with sanctified imagination, you just you read them, it's like, be. You have to ask yourself, why am I being told to be? You know, if you're, if you're going to high school and you've never been to high school before and you're going to boarding, and your dad says, now, be on your guard. Stand firm. Be courageous. What? Be strong. What do you immediately start figuring out? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, things may not be what they were telling me they're going to be. There might be some challenges coming ahead. So when you read these scriptures, you understand that God said we must be, which means he knew things would happen that would require us to be. There are things that you will face that will make you have to be, you have to choose to be, because nobody will choose for you. Some of you have found yourself in very difficult situations in your businesses where it's almost like compromise or die. Your business dies. And you have to decide, what am I going to be? Yeah, because it's a decision. God isn't going to make the decision for you. You know, Pastor Caro here and I, one of these, one of, a Caro you don't know, but she and I are neighbors. And we are putting up a development together. And our engineer told us, if you are not willing to pay a bribe for your electricity connection, you won't get it. And we had been waiting for several years to get that connection, and we finally were in line. And the person said, if you don't pay the bribe now, you will be taken right to the back, to the bottom of the line. And you might not get this connection. And remember, the houses are almost done. We're thinking about how we're moving in, and the person says, you pay the bribe or you lose the opportunity. And you know, we had to look at each other and say, oh, and the guy was like, guys, I know you're pastors. I know you love God. But me, if I was you, I can't. This one you don't mess around with. Even pastors, I know, pa even pastors, this one is beyond you. Give. We had to look at each other and say, eh, what do we do? And I must say, I'm so proud because the team that I was with, they were all like, let's stay without electricity. <laughs> we'll just use candles until the Lord says we get our electricity. And I was so proud for that. God gave us a way, by the way, didn't he? God opened a miraculous way through a daughter of this house who came and said, Pastor Emma, here you're struggling. I know how to get you that electricity. But you know, even if the daughter hadn't come, me, I was ready to stay in the darkness. Because I said, I'm not going to stumble. I'm not going to, I'm not going to compromise on my faith. But yeah, I am the light of the world. I don't need, I don't need to be connected to light to become light. Yeah. And some of you, that's exactly where you are in your office right now. There's a compromise. If you don't sign this document, you're going to lose your job. I don't know. I'm talking to somebody in the house. I know. Some of you, it's in your marriage. You're in a place where you're so tested, the natural thing is for you to quit. Guess what? God knew you would face these challenges. And what did he tell you? Stand firm. Let nothing move you. You need to be able to say, I'm not moving because nothing is moving me. I'm here until the Lord says I leave. And the Lord has said he hates divorce, so I ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Stand firm. Be on your guard. So how do you backslide proof your faith? I'm just going to give you, I think, five, maybe six, <laughs> not seven for sure, uh, things that you must do to backslide proof your faith. This whole morning we've talked about backsliding. We've talked about what makes people backslide. We've talked about our responsibility to the backsliders. But now we're talking about how to make sure our faith stands firm. Number one, surrender. Surrender to Jesus. That's the first thing. I want to say that the one thing that will guarantee that you stand in your faith is surrender. Surrendering to Jesus. It's interesting because when you surrender to Jesus, all of you belongs to him. And the devil has nothing he can touch. If all of me and all that I am, all that I have, all I hope to be, completely surrendered, the devil has no space. Because the scriptures in the book of Ephesians Chapter 4, verse 27 says, Do not give the devil a foothold. What does that mean? It means that as a Christian, because this was not written to non-Christians, the devil can actually have a legal claim on your life. I remember there's a pastor who asked me recently from another church. He had Pastor Carol's, uh, Pastor Carol had led 
us through praying about bondages and, and, and uh, evil foundations in our families. And I posted something online. This was, uh, I put up something on my WhatsApp. The next day, as I was reading through the scriptures, I found something that was very connected to that. So I put it on my, my WhatsApp status. I've been doing that. I just made a commitment. I'm going to do that every day of the year and just share my devotion uh, uh, on my WhatsApp status. And this pastor wrote and said, are you saying that Christians can, have, can be oppressed by the devil? Is that even biblical? Ephesians 4.27. And do not give the devil a what? Yeah. This was not being written to non-Christians. It was being written to Christians. It means that you can be a Christian, card-carrying church member, full, full, of, full of God's power, and the devil has a foothold in your life. A foothold means a legal claim. That when you try to chase him, he says, I'm here by rights. I don't believe as a, de as a Christian you can be demon-possessed. It's impossible because you have the spirit in you. But you can give the devil a foothold that limits your growth in the Lord. And the Bible says, don't give the devil a foothold. You know, there's a story I read about this man who was buying a house. He was looking for a house. And he found an amazing, amazing house. And he found the owner, and the owner was like, I, I don't want to sell, but he, he said, please sell it to me. And then the owner gave him the price, and he said, I can't afford, but I really want your house. And the owner told him, okay, fine. I'll sell it to you on one condition. There's a doornail that is on the front door. That one I cannot sell to you. That one I really, I can't sell. But the rest of the house I'll sell at your price. And the guy was like, Wow! He was so excited. What's the catch? And the guy says, there's no catch. Just don't touch my nail. I have rights on my nail. And the guy says, done. Done deal. Here's the money. They signed. And the old man went. And the guy was so excited, he refurbished the house. He painted it. He got everything happening. He remembered there's a nail on the door, but it's like, that's a nail. He painted everything. He painted around the nail and just left a little dot around it untouched because that's not his face. But the house was his. He's celebrating until he had a door knock a couple of months later. And he opened the door and the old man was standing there. And he asked, what do you want? And the man had a dead dog. And he said, I've come to claim my space. And he hung his dead dog on the nail. And he walked away. And the man remembered they had a legal agreement. He could not touch anything on that nail because that nail belonged to the old man. And hours turned into days. And the day turned into a week, and the dead dog started to smell. It was infested by maggots. It was stinking. The man was now using the back door. He couldn't even sit in the front near that door. But he knew he had no rights to that little nail. But that smell was pushing him slowly out of the house until eventually he got to the place where he couldn't even occupy the house anymore. And he walked out and went to look for the old man and said, I can't live in the house. And the old man told him, that's okay. And the man went and took back possession of his house. That little nail cost the man the whole house. That's how the devil operates, by the way. Give him, I want to give my life to Jesus, all right. But there's something you can't touch. Don't touch that part of you watching Netflix movies every night. You can't give that part to Jesus. Uh-uh. That one belongs to me. That, that career and the progression and the plan you have, uh-uh. That little part... Everything else is Jesus's, but that part is mine. That plan you have to get married at all costs, and you know this is something God owes, that part don't touch. Everything else give to Jesus, but Jesus, this one part. Your money and your plan to be rich, Lord, don't touch that part. Everything else you can touch. You've watched the Mizizi guy, the guy who's baptized, and then he goes up and leaves a wallet in the air. It's like, cover everything, baptize everything, but don't touch my money. That's how it is. But guess what? That's all the devil needs. He just needs one legal foothold in your life. That Netflix watching will be the cause of your downfall and the downfall of your faith. Eventually, your faith will become such an inhospitable place that the Holy Spirit will be pushed out more and more and more out of your life because of that nail and the things you're allowing to enter into your life. That, that, that demand for your career, 
That thing that says whatever, whatever my career comes, that always comes first, not God's thing. It will slowly stink the Holy Spirit out of your life. And you'll soon find yourself in a place where the devil is coming back to take what was his because of the little nail. And that's why surrender is so important. Isn't that a graphic illustration? Can you see a guy being pushed out of the house because of a smell, a smelly, rotting dog carcass hanging on one little nail? We give our lives to Jesus, but we leave the devil a little nail, and that's all he needs. You know, it's very interesting that the only way to completely backslide proof your faith is through surrender. It's through surrender. It's through making sure there's nothing in my life that if God asked of me, that I would even think of withholding. It's his, completely. My life belongs to him. And when the devil comes, he touches it. You're like, it's not mine. <laughs> it belongs to God. When people touch, by the way, let me just tell you something. Everything I own is God's. So if you attack it, it's not me who defends it. He can defend it. He can actually defend it. I don't need to defend myself. If you try and kick me out of this church, I'll do this. This, this, this whole thing, this whole Pastor M story, I'm doing it because it's God's. I don't need to be a pastor. I don't need to be rich. I don't need to have a reputation. I'm crucified in Christ. Galatians 2.20, what does it say? I've been crucified in Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you go into your office, if you really desperately need that job, there's nothing you won't do for it. But if you know I've been crucified in Christ, you guys want to fire me because I'm not signing it? Praise God. All right. Take your job. I know the one who defends me. Yeah. He's the one who gave me the job, not even you. And so I'm willing to let go and let God because God can defend his own. And let me tell you, God defends his property. God defends his property. I usually tell people, and I think I've said, I might have said this in front before. I usually tell the people who work for me, and I tell my wife when we're hiring a person, I need to tell somebody this. The things in my house, they're sanctified things. <laughs> they're holy things. They belong to God. Steal them at your detriment. Steal them at risk. I know some people think you're just hyping them, trying to spook them. I'm like, God can defend his stuff. And he has defend. I've seen God defending his belongings. I don't need to defend them. Because if you steal them, the Holy Spirit will deal with you. They don't belong to me. It's such a freeing way to live, by the way, when you're surrendered. Because you no longer hold on to your life like this. You live like this. Even bad news. When bad news comes, I know where to take it. I'm not determined. My moods don't determine me. The situations at Mabuno don't bother me. It's not to say that I don't feel bad, but I'm able to go and release it to the one who takes it, and then I sleep. And boy, do I sleep well. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. I sleep so well. I can have had a whole horrible meeting. Things have gone badly wrong. But when I hit my pillow, ha, I sleep so well. Because I don't own it. I know God's going to look after those children. God's going to look after that business. It is His. My friends, I commend to you the genius of surrender. Yeah, it's the best thing any Christian can ever do. 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. In other words, don't, choose, don't, don't, don't hold God and something else. Don't live divided. By the way, you're cheating yourself. If you really think that, 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 that money is everything, follow money. At least have a bit of temporary pleasure as you follow it. You know, it won't satisfy you, but at least have... Now you're here being sad because you're here trying to serve God, you're trying to serve man. You're so miserable. Follow one thing. If God is God, you follow him. And I think that was such a powerful, uh, such a powerful charge. And I believe it's a charge that God has for his people today. If God is God, follow him. Stop wavering between two opinions. Don't let the devil ever th let you think that anything he has is better than what God has for you, by the way. Uh, what God has for you is always better. There's always peace. His blessings bring wealth without sorrow. Wealth without sorrow. So that's number one, surrender to Jesus. Number two, own your faith. Own your faith. 
Remember, we're talking about how to backslide proof your faith. There are many people who did not surrender and it just slowly dragged them down. But the next thing you need to do is own your faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Is someone saying amen or are they asleep? Let's look at your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, I put the ways of childhood behind me. There are ways of childhood that we have sometimes as Christians. You see, children come into the world helpless. They need to be fed. What do children do all their lives? Eat, sleep, and eat some more. Oh yeah, go to the bathroom. That's the other thing. And maybe play when they're old enough. And in all these things, they need someone to supervise them because they can't do it by themselves. They should be able, but you know, but the thing about it is as your child grows, you must train them to do chores. You must train them to carry responsibility in the house. Because if you don't, you're going to have adult children in your house. And then someone's husband, you're training up someone's husband to be an adult child in his own house. I usually tell parents, be very careful. You're training someone's spouse. You're bringing up a husband. You're bringing up a wife. Every time you're spoiling that child, understand you're destroying a marriage. So you're bringing someone up to be responsible. If you have a 20-year-old in your house and all they do is eat, sleep, and play, I put it to you, you are in trouble. Yeah, if, if you're 18 year old, you're 20 year old, that's all they want to do, eat, sleep, and play video games. Some, some parents know what, exactly what I'm talking about. That's a, that's a child with an adult body. And that's not what you want. But the same is true when you're a baby Christian. You need someone to feed you spiritually. You need someone to almost force you to join a discipleship group because you don't know you need it. You need someone to call you when you're late for prayers at 4.30. You need someone to teach you how to pray and fast and why you must do it and encourage you so you do it. The church is that spiritual family that becomes your parent and helps you to do that. But with time, you must grow up. Tell your neighbor you need to grow up. Yeah, you need to get to a place where you're not praying and fasting because Mavuno asked you to pray and fast, but because you know you need it. You're not doing it for somebody else. You don't wake up for 4.30 prayers because that's what our DG is asking us to do. You're there on time because you know how desperately you need those prayers to give you instructions for your day. You're not reading the scripture because your, your discipleship group leader is going to ask you at the end of the week where you are. You're reading it because you know you need it. You, you, you're, you're, you're the place where you, you're not tithing and giving your fast fruits because they're making, the, the, the pastor is talking about every day on Sunday. You're doing it because you know the promises of God for your life and you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And you're doing it because now you understand, my goodness, I cannot live without this principle of generosity. That's what God put me on earth for. This is what it means to grow, to become mature. You, you, you now do it because you understand that God has called you to a life of radical generosity. And you get to the place where now you're helping your own disciples to do what was being done for you. You're now at the place where you're waking up people for 4.30. And you're saying to them, guys, let's read the scriptures. Please, have you reached, has everybody read? You're the place now where you're now bringing up your own children. That's what maturity is. It's interesting because in the book of Hebrews 5.12, it says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. So think about that. In the scripture, it's telling us that the mark of maturity is not about consuming. He says, by this time you ought to be teachers. In other words, a mature Christian is one who is teaching others. It's not a person who is now able to consume in more languages. Now I even can read the Bible in Hebrew. Now I can consume it in Greek. That's not maturity. You're just a bigger consumer. You're a bigger baby. But what you need to be is a person who by this time you're now teaching others to do it. And that's how you grow in your faith as you help others to grow in their faith. And that's the thing you must do then. To, back, to, sound, uh, to, to uh, backslide proof your faith is own your faith. Get to a place where now it doesn't matter if nobody shows up at 4.30, you're there. You're the first one there. In fact, you're there at 4.20. And if the pastor doesn't show up, you can even start the prayers because you know why you need them, isn't it? Yeah, this is what it, call, this is what it means where the pastor is no longer the one driving the church. He's got his army there already. 
and they're already moving forward. They know why they need these prayers. Pastor James didn't show up because something happened. Somebody else is already on. Pastor James is not here, but as he comes. Guys, can we just begin with adoration? We know what we do. Come on, somebody. That's how you see people growing in the church. They've owned their faith. They're not there for somebody else. Tell your neighbor, own your faith. I believe that God is helping many people in Mavuno Church own their faith. I love the fact that there are people in Mavuno Church now who are leading campuses. They're bivocational pastors. Uh, they're not even theological trained, but they've understood it. Maturity has nothing to do with theological training. There's no Bible verse that says, by, now, by this time you ought to have had a theological degree. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. It says, by this time you ought to be teaching others. And so they've understood, I've been fed. And even as I'm being fed, I can feed someone else. I don't have to wait until the day I'll know everything to start teaching another. And I bless God because there are many among you who are stepping up and owning their faith and beginning to understand that this is about me. It's not even about Mavuno. It's about me and my destiny and the thing that God has called me to do. So on, tell your neighbor again for the, the other neighbor, own your faith. Own your faith. Number three, the, the third thing, walk with others. Walk with others. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21 to 26 the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat and are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts have, need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so there should be no division in the body. All parts should have equal concern for each other because if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. You know, some of us, we don't like being with people. Some of us, people are actually an inconvenience. And it's more a factor of we're not bad people, it's our personalities. I just get drained by people. Am I talking to anybody in the house? It's like I get drained. Like if I'm around people too long, even right now just being in this crowd, I'm feeling drained already. Uh, I'm only going to ask, ask you to put up your hand because that's even going to stress you more if you, knowing your personality. Thank you. I can see you saying thank you, Pastor M. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you're just drained by people. Being around people just drains you. Having people in your house is just tiresome. I mean, being around and caring for people, my gosh, that just finishes you. It's not something you enjoy. It's emotionally draining. But Paul is saying you will never be great alone. You need other people. You need to learn how to work with other people. You need to learn to overcome those things about you that think I don't need people. And to realize in this Christian faith, you need all the help you can get. You know, our children have different personalities. And one of our children is very melancholic. Don't even try and guess which one. Very, very melancholic. And you know how males can be? You don't know how males can be. Males can wake up with a cloud of, it's like a cloud with thunderstorm and lightning above their head as they're coming downstairs in the morning. And you just look at them and it's like they're just waiting to shoot down the first person who says anything to them in a manner likely to suggest anything to them. You know what I'm talking about? And they come down, it's like everybody just shrinks back. You want to sink into the wall and not touch that person because you know whoever touches them first is in trouble. You enter the office and, and there are people like that. You enter the office and everybody takes cover. And they know, wait until 10 o'clock before you ask them a question. They load slowly. I'm, now you understand who I'm talking about, the kind of people. But I remember what Pastor Carol would teach, because Pastor Carol is a male as well. And one of the things she would teach our children is, listen, your mood is your issue. Understand, you take control. You take control with the, the fruit of the Spirit is what God expects from you. And the fruit of the Spirit is not dependent on your personality. And so he'd, she'd say to that child, wake up half an hour earlier, put on praise music, praise yourself into a good mood, and then come downstairs smiling at the rest of us. Because any bad moods, they're not acceptable in this house. And I'm glad it was her saying it, because you see, she's a fellow male, so she's saying it from her own experience. If it was me, the child would have thought I'm bullying them. Because me, I'm a sanguine, I wake up at the top of my voice. Good morning, guys! <laughs> It's 4.30 in the morning. Come on, somebody. I'm so happy to be here. Wow. Look at all these people. I'm so happy. That's a sanguine, by the way. It's like you're all awake. I love it. Any sanguines in the house? You see? 
sanguines, you ask them to put up their hands, they're even happy to be identified. We are here. We love it. <laughs> but, but males are not like that. But for Pastor Caro, it was like, no, 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 no. The joy of the Lord, that is the strength that you have. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. The seriousness of the Lord is not anywhere in the Bible. Yeah. So in our house, you take charge of your moods, you take control, and you own it for yourself. And I think that's the thing about walking with others, understanding I'm a social being. I know I may not like people. I must find ways to energize myself because I'm not excused from being with people and loving people. I must find ways to deal with it. I must find ways once I've been with them and what we do with Pastor Carol because she's a male, once we've had visitors, I let her go and sit down somewhere. And I don't talk to her, by the way. There's a regulation time that you just allow the woman to just do, listen to music, do something for herself. In fact, sometimes it continues till the next morning. But I've learned, just give her space. Because she has to usa, now she has to bring it all back. The energy she lost, the virtue that left her has to come back. And that's okay. That's a beautiful thing because she has understood how to do it so that she can shepherd the people she needs to shepherd. Am I talking to somebody in the house? Yeah. So, so you need others. We all need to walk with others. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, many people have found all kinds of excuses to stop walking together. And you know the story. The minute you stop walking with others, your fire will burn down. That's the way it works. Almost guaranteed. Any Christian who is now a solo Christian doing online church by themselves, you're, you're at great risk for losing your faith. Very great risk. Now, even the people who watch online and don't have Christians in the country they're in, I say find, find, an, find an, a, DG, a virtual DG. Find a space of connecting. Because none of us was meant to be a Christian alone. The more as the day approaches, because what, what, what Hebrews says, as you see the day approaching, which tells you as the trouble is coming, the trouble we've been talking about is coming, you will need your community. You will need people around with you. Encouraging one another, the more as you see the day approaching. And these Christians were being told by the light, in light of Christ's second coming, not meeting together was not an option. Not meeting together is not an option for you. You need the body. An isolated Christian is a vulnerable Christian. Number four. Okay, let's see who's awake. Number one was what? Sign to Jesus. Number two. At what? <laughs> Number three. Walk with others. All right, thank you very much. Number four, resist offense. Resist offense. Yeah, resist it. Offense, by the way, will always come. Offense will always come. You must resist offense. You must fight it with all your heart. Resist offense. You know, Hebrews 12, 14, verse, 12, Hebrews 12, 14 and 15, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So, are you seeing that connection? Being at peace gives room for you to be holy. You can't be, at, you can't be holy if you're not at peace. And without holiness, you will not see God. Is there, is there, are you seeing something there? Make every effort, every effort to live at peace with others and to be holy. Because without, there's a because. Whenever there's a because, it means a thing before it caused it. Because... Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make every effort. Tell your neighbor, make every effort. Yeah. Because without holiness, you will not see the Lord. And he says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. In other words, you're responsible for yourself. The, the person who brought the offense is not re responsible for you. Whatever they did, you're not responsible for their actions. You're responsible for your response. Yeah. And that response can cause a bitter root to grow up and defile you. So you're here in church raising your holy hands, and the Lord is saying, that is a defiled worship. I will not accept it. Why? Because of the bitter root that is in your heart. He says, make every effort. Don't allow offense. Let me tell you, as a pastor of Mavuno, I have 
ample reason to be offended. <laughs> if I could tell you some stories. Uh, 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 I have ample reason. And this offense happens every month, by the way. As long as, as long as I've been leading this church, by the way, I've had reason to be offended. People will do things to you. People will say things about you that you're thinking, what in the world possessed this person to say such a thing? People will gossip about you. People will go and give people, your friends stories about you that are absolute lies. You know, it's so interesting. I tell you guys stories and you look at me very blankly. <laughs> you know, you know yesterday, yesterday I was meeting the campus pastors. I met all the campus pastors. We had a pre-gathering gathering for the campus pastors. And I told them, I'm so happy nowadays I have people who believe all my stories. Because they've also gone through them. Just by virtue of being a campus pastor, they've already gone through all these things that I talk about. People have told them things. People have walked out on them. People have... And I was like, I'm so happy nowadays I'm not alone in this church. There are people who feel me. Huh? There are people who feel me in this church because they've been through those things. I have every reason to be offended. But the Bible described a bitter root that grows and it defiles you because of offense. I mean, I know somebody who was so offended by the pastor of their church that they just began to talk about that pastor and to say how this person was unsuitable and how they shouldn't lead this church and how they just, how, how could a pastor do this? And you know what happened? Slowly, other people in the church began to get offended with the pastor. Have you heard of secondary offense? Yes. Where somebody's offended at you and you did nothing to them, but they're offended because their friend is offended at you. And as a result of that, many people actually left that church. And the thing about it is, your offense now has caused somebody else to compromise and be in a place where they are vulnerable for the enemy. Because of your offense, you're just spreading the bitter root around you. And there are people who just can't keep offense. They just keep talking to everybody. Talk, talk, talk. And they're just spreading offense. You know, it's very interesting because whispering rumors, it just really destroys the work of God. I mean, somebody, got, somebody misunderstood something Pastor M said. But instead of asking Pastor M, they now went to look for other people. By the way, did you also hear Pastor M say this? Like, how could a pastor say that? Like, what is he saying? What is he saying? Gosh, sometimes I feel offending people. Because so many things I say are taken out of context. So, in, in the September gathering... <laughs> <laughs> in the September gathering, this, this sneaky man here knows what I'm talking about. I taught people what to do with people who try and cause them to be offended and how to avoid those things that will harm their own faith. And I said, what do you do with those things? Now, let me tell you the story that went out from that gathering. That Pastor M is saying, anybody who doesn't agree to Mavuno, go away. <laughs> now, you guys were there. But it's interesting because, remember what I talked about? I said when people are independent, then independence causes offense. If your heart is already feeling offended and aloof, anything small will cause offense. That story went out until I was, some, I was summoned by pastors in this city. What are you telling people in your church? You're chasing people away from your church. I said, ah. When did I chase people away from my church? Me, I love my people. But that's a story that went out. Because somebody, instead of coming to talk to me and ask me, Pastor M, are you saying I should leave your church? They now took offense and went to talk about it with many other people, saying, Pastor M is chasing us. Did you hear yourself being chased? Me, I had myself being chased. Even you, you must have been being chased. Because he was saying to all of us, away. In fact, the, the pastors were asking me, this is a song you're teaching people about chasing people away from their church. That's why I say, I'm so glad that the gatherings are online. Because me, I tell people, go and watch what I said. There's nothing I say in the, in the dark. I say it publicly. Huh? The, so, the album is called The One I Fall. Yeah. <laughs> what? Fire, fire, fire. You must resist offense, God's people. And the Bible teaches us how to do it. I want to teach you this principle because it is absolutely critical and all of you in this room you need to know this principle of how to resist offense 
I want to say this, and I'm, I want to say this on record. In fact, Pastor Kure, if you can cut this part, just this little part of how I'm going to teach people how to resist offense, and put it as a little clip that we can always show people, I think it's important. I want to teach you how to resist offense, God's people. The Bible says very clearly that going around and spreading rumors, going around and spreading offense is not the thing to do. If you ever hear me say something that is not positive, something that you think a pastor shouldn't say that, something that you think, Pastor M, you sounded unrighteous when you said that. It was not the right thing. The Bible has a clear way that you go about that. And that clear way, let me see if I can find it. The clear way is in the book of Matthew, chapter 18. I call it throwing a rope. This is what I call it. I call it throwing a rope. When somebody has offended you, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17 says, if your brother or sister sins, and sins is about you, it's, it's against you. This person has sinned. They've done something that has offended you. Go and point out their fault just between you and the rest of the church. It doesn't say that. What does it say? Just between the two of you. So listen, maybe you don't know how to catch me. Maybe you don't know where I work. Maybe you don't have time to come and look for me. Send me a text. Inbox me on Instagram. Find me. Send me. Just say, Pastor M, when you said in the gathering, clap, clap, clap away. You can even just say it that way. <laughs> I felt like you're saying I should leave your church. I really felt really unhappy. Why would a pastor say that to his people? I really feel like that was a hard, that was a hard thing. I left really hard. It says, go and point it out between the two of you. You haven't put a post on Instagram. You haven't told the whole world. You haven't gone and told your discipleship group how you're offended. Why are you telling them? It has not, they were not the ones offended. It was you. So put it there. That's what Matthew says. What have you just done? You've thrown me a rope. Now, if someone has dug themselves into a hole, they have two options when you throw them a rope. They can use that rope to pull themselves up or they can hang themselves with it. When you throw me that rope, I can either tell you, in fact, it was you I was talking about. I've just hung myself, isn't it? Because what I've done is I've proved to you that your suspicion is right. And at that point, you know you have a choice because you know I'm not a safe person to be around. Or I might tell you, I'm so sorry. That was not what I meant. I did not intend to say that. If you heard that, I'm really, really sorry because what I was saying was this. And what have I just done? I've pulled myself out. And by, by doing that, I'm able to have, you're able to say, oh, he didn't actually mean that. Because many times, guess what happens? When you come to church, you come with your issues. All of us have issues. I'm, I'm not talking about me, I'm, uh, you. I'm talking about all of us. We all come to, I came to church with my issues. So you might hear me talk about, you need a father. And you're like so offended. By the way, somebody can be so offended. Somebody in this church would hear, I, I might say, I'm your father. And somebody in this church says, I love that Pastor M is my spiritual father. I'm so happy. Somebody else might say, are you trying to replace my father? Are you trying to say my, you're better than my father? Because we all come with our own issues, isn't it? Somebody else might even say, my father hurt me. I don't even want anything to do with you after that. It's just where we come from. So your offense may not be because of me. It might be because of you. And when you get the rope, when I pull myself up, you're able to say, oh, I think I misunderstood what my pastor was saying. Case solved. Everybody's happy. You've solved the issue without causing any harm. It says, if they listen to you, you've won them over. Now you're like, oh, in fact, Pastor M even knows my name. <laughs> you know, we are, we, are, we are boys now. And I feel good in that church. But 16 says, if they hang themselves, if they do not listen, what do you do? Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two to three witnesses. What does that mean? It means I now call somebody I trust that I believe Pastor M will listen to. It could be my DG leader. It could be my campus pastor. It could be somebody else. And I say, Pastor M, we really need to talk because I really feel that what you said was not something a man of God should say. And I'm coming with Pastor Kilonzi so that we can meet. Or we're doing a Zoom call. And I've asked my pastor if he'd be open to that so that we can actually have a threesome because I really feel like I need to be heard. And then we have the Zoom call. And at that point, guess what happens? Two things could happen. I could find that my pastor vindicates and says, Yenyewe, that was not right. And that person is able to hold this other person accountable and say, that was not the right thing to do. Or 
I might find that my pastor turns back and tells me, you're the one with issues here. Which is good for me because I needed to know, isn't it? I didn't walk into this thing feeling righteous. I walked in because I was hurt. And maybe God allowed me to be hurt so I can learn something about myself. So I come in open and I might leave there saying, what? I really didn't understand how brittle I am. I really didn't understand how, you know, and I've learned something about myself that I need to work with. Or it, the matter is established between two witnesses and now it's known. Pastor M has an issue. If they still refuse to listen, because Pastor M could say, who the heck do you think you are with your campus pastor? <laughs> Tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. And that's what, what that is saying is at that point, I have confirmed to you that I'm no better than a tax collector or a pagan. And at that point, you should treat me like that person. Now, it's interesting because Pastor James said something recently that really caught my attention. It was in our group. We have a, a, a New Testament Bible reading, and everybody posts their reflections. And he said something. I remember that day I was just reading through people's, and I read Pastor James, and I just felt like an oof. Because what Pastor James said is, how did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? I was like, whoa. <laughs> he loved them anyway. Probably, it means love me from a distance. It's still not giving you a right to gossip about me, insult me, tell the whole world how useless I am. Treat me like a pagan or tax collector, which means now bring me to the Lord in prayer. And maybe you need to pull yourself away and say, I've understood that this man is not who he says he is, so now I'm going to take it as my burden to pray for the Lord to reform him. That's how you stop offense from coming to your heart. Because why were you offended? Because you are ready to take offense. But if you are not, and you're working with the Lord. Remember, this whole process you've been through, it has not hurt you. Because what have you come out and concluding? Pastor M has issues. Those are Pastor M's issues. They have nothing to do with me. Come on, somebody. Is this, are you, you're looking uncomfortable. You don't think Pastor M has issues. Pastor M has serious issues. Yeah, but you've walked away not with any offense to hurt your own faith and bring bitter root. You've walked away with understanding that your pastor has issues. He's very flawed and he needs someone to pray for him. That's what you've walked away with. An offense is not part of your life. Am I, is somebody here with me? Yes. This is how we deal with offense in every level. Whenever somebody comes to you and offends you, the first thing, go and just tell them, by the way, when you did this, I really felt hurt. Don't accuse. Don't say you're really evil because you said this about me. That's not how it's saying. It's saying, go and tell them, when you say these words, I don't know what you meant, but for me, the way I heard it, I heard this and it really hurt me. So I'm, 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 putting, I'm making myself vulnerable there, and I'm giving you an option. And at that point, if you choose not to listen, then I go and get some friends. Maybe I even get someone who has authority over you, and I come back, or we come back with my DG leaders, and we're like, okay, we really need to sit down, because I, I, I feel you didn't hear me the first time, and I still feel like it's really hurting me that you didn't. And then there's a second chance. At that point, the person refuses. Then you get the church. Maybe getting the church now is where your campus pastor comes in. And now you have the church and you're able to say there's something going on. This person is persisting in doing something wrong and we need to confront it. And then at the last stage, that's when you then say, ha, huh, treat this person as an unbeliever. Let me tell you, there are people who've misunderstood or mis disagreed with what's happening at Mavuno. And the way they, what they've resorted to do is go and talk to other pastors about it. They haven't talked it, about it with me. They haven't raised their concerns. And then one of my brother pastors in the city calls me and says, hey, what are you doing to people in your church? And I'm thinking, what do you mean? He says, this person came, actually many times they'll say, somebody came and told me this and this, and I'm not even supposed to say who they are. You know how hurtful that is? Your offense now has caused another offense. As opposed to healing, you've brought offense. So resist offense. Tell your neighbor, resist offense. Yeah. Somebody in your discipleship group hurts you. This is what you do. Talk to them. Get someone else. Talk to, there's a process. There's a three-step process to how to never get offended. But we follow this three-step process and we will make sure there's no bitter root in our churches. There's no bitter root in our discipleship groups. There's no bitter root in this movement. Offense will never be used by the devil to split this church or to bring people to their knees, to hurt the faith of people. May the Lord make us gracious people in this church. Yeah. And if you hear someone coming to gossip to you, the first question you need to ask them is, have you talked to him about it? Yeah. Before you come and defile me with your bitter roots and give me secondary offense, go talk to them. If they fail, come back with me. I will be your second person. We'll go and discuss. 
But for us to sit here and gossip about our pastor, gossip about our DG member, that's actually adding sin to sin. Is somebody feeling helped? Am I helping somebody? Yeah. But let's follow this. By the way, this is the best. If we follow this model, it's an arbitration model in the scripture, and it's a phenomenal model that I believe will keep many churches intact and keep the devil from our midst. Amen. Pastor Kuria, it's a wrap. You have your, your little tape there. Uh, amen. Amen. <laughs> Number five, refuse lukewarmness. I've got, I've, got, I've got two more, just five and six. Re refuse to be lukewarm. Refuse lukewarmness. You know the verse in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. It says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. And so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus was speaking to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea was a very rich city. The church was full of rich people. They thought they were really doing well. But Jesus, Jesus uses a, a, a metaphor because the people of Laodicea, they were known for their, their water, their water source. And it was very interesting because water can have two, could have, those days were seen, it should have two natures. There were cities that had hot springs. Hot springs were very useful because people could bathe in them People could use the water for, it, it was heated water, they could use it for other purposes, uh, medic, medicinal purposes. Other cities had cold springs. And cold springs were beautiful because you could use them for refreshing water. It's water you could feed your animals, you could take and drink. But Lodisha did not have any of the two. The water source in Lodisha came from an aqueduct about six miles away from the city. And by the time it arrived in the city, it was disgustingly warm. It wasn't cold enough to drink. It wasn't hot enough to wash clothes in. It was lukewarm. It had the consistency and taste of saliva. And it was a you thing. It's like people just knew the water in Lodisha, it's not for drinking. You, if you drank it as a stranger, you came here so thirsty after traveling to get there and you drank it, you <sighs> what was that? It's like, ah, horrible thing to taste. And that's what Jesus tells the Christians in Lodisha. Because you're neither hot or cold. I will spew you out of my mouth. I will spit you out of my mouth. You're sickening. You see, lukewarmness is when we become indifferent towards God. It's a cooling down of our zeal for Him. When we're lukewarm, we're not cold in our faith. We're not anti-God. We're not like, I don't like church. I don't like this Christianity. In fact, I'm going to spend my whole life deconstructing it. I don't believe in you. God is like, I even prefer you like that. There's more hope for you when you're like that. You know, when you're cold. Or when you're hot, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. God's like, choose one of the two, please. This one in the middle, I don't know what to do with. It's horrible. And that's that person who is like, you're here and you're here. When people are talking against God, you're there. When people are talking for God, you're there. You have no stand of your own. You are lukewarm. And Jesus says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Revelations chapter 3 verse 19, he gives them the prescription for lukewarmness. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. That's after talking to Laodiceans. Because you know the Laodiceans, they really believe they are everything. They are all that in a bag of chips. And Jesus told them, by the way, you think you're rich, you're poor, naked, blind, and wretched. In fact, he said, blind, buy for yourself salve and clothes. Like, be spiritual people. Stop being, stop being people without a stand. But then he says a very powerful thing at the end. And I love his blessing because God always ends with a blessing. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. In other words, I was not rebuking you because I hate you. I was rebuking you because I love you. And then he says, therefore, come on, let's read that together. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Let me say something about being zealous. The dictionary describes being zealous as showing great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or objective. That's what it means to be zealous. It has to do with passionately responding to God. Some of us are very dignified people. We come from very dignified backgrounds. I grew up in the most dignified background possible. I'm an Anglican. And I grew up in the Anglican church. We're taught how to be dignified in church. Any former Anglicans or any Anglicans in the house? Yeah, yeah. We know how to be dignified. We know how to stand up and be dignified. And I remember back in the day, we didn't show much emotion in church. That was just not the thing you did in church. You're dignified. God is a God of order. Any Presbyterians in the house? Yeah. God is a God of order. We follow it. We don't detour or deviate. God is a God of order. 
And that's how I grew up. Then I joined Nairobi Chapel. That's where I was trained. And Nairobi Chapel is a dignified church. And I learned to be a dignified Christian. I know how to pray in a dignified way. And then I came to Mavuno. Oi. <laughs> By the way, I, love, I, I thank God that I learned the dignity that the faith deserves. But you know, how many of you know that dignity sometimes gets in the way of our faith with God? Yeah. Sometimes we can be so reserved, we don't know how to express ourselves with love towards God. And it's like, God, I love God so much. I really love God. It's just in my heart. In my heart, I'm a Christian. I love God. It's like, you ever heard that story of the guy who was asked by his wife, do you love me, sweetie? And the guy said, I told you I loved you and I married you and you'll be the first to know if I change my mind. <laughs> it's like, what do you do with a man like that? I mean, he's telling you he loves you, but he's not showing it. He's just so dignified around you. He's like, he's so calm. He, he doesn't even look like he likes being seen with you in public. He's so stoic. But he's like, in my heart, I love you. Huh? I don't need to send you cards. I don't need to send you CG flowers, chocolate. What nonsense is that? I love you. You know I love you in my heart. <laughs> I can see the chicks in the house going, heck no. Ain't no way I'm being seen with a brother like that. But many of us are like that in our faith with Jesus. We are so dignified, it's like, Lord, I mean, it's like it pains you to lift your hand in worship. It's like me, I was taught to be stoic. I, don't, I, 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 just look, I just look serious in the house of God. The house of God is about seriousness. Jesus, I told you I loved you and I got saved. You'll be the first to know if I change my mind. <laughs> the Bible says, be zealous and repent. There's a place for zeal. There's a place for action. You know that person who tells you that, you know, some people even look down on their spouse because they say, you are just emotional. I, this thing of wanting a TCG holding hands, what, that's just emotion. You're just being emotional. Actually, the problem is not your spouse. The problem is you. You're emotionally stunted. You have issues expressing yourself emotionally. The problem is you. You need to pray and ask God, God, show me how to express love so someone feels it. Show me how to love my wife so she feels loved. By the way, I'm saying this because me, I've prayed for myself like that. Yeah, I, I could be one of those. I could have been easily one of those clinical people. You know, men, when they're chasing their wife, they're very emotional. <laughs> it's, called, it's called spouse acquisition mode. When a man is on spouse acquisition mode, he lets aside everything else and he makes her the sole focus of his attention and desire. Whatever it takes, if she likes perfume, I'll get you perfume. If it's flowers she wants, I'll get her flowers. If it's holding hands, I will even hold hands. If it's carrying the handbag, I'll even carry the handbag. Whatever it takes. I want this woman, I'll do what it takes. And then they get the wife. The last thing he was heard saying is, I do. <laughs> uh, am I helping your neighbor? That's the last time he was emotional. I do. That's it. Once he did, he did. <laughs> it is finished. It, he might as well have said it is finished. Now he went into money acquisition mode. And it's like, you should understand. Now you're in the box. Now let me do what I came here to do. <laughs> and it's a very confusing thing for the woman, by the way. Because she's like, seriously, you wooed me. I came on board and then you moved on. But many Christians were like that. We're emotionally stunted. We don't know how to show our expression before God. And I pray for myself, the same way I prayed for myself to love my wife in a way she feels loved, I pray for myself to love God in a way that I show my love to Him. Guys, I used to watch people crying in worship and I'm like, God, what is it that they have? What do they know that I don't know? Because me, I want to cry and I can't cry. Like, what's wrong with these people? Like, how do they love God so much that they lift up their hands and start crying? Lord, I want that thing. I want it. And you see people just saying, I, man, yesterday I talked to Jesus, he came, and I'm like, you talked to him, how did you talk to him? Why is he talking to you and not to me, you know? It's like, want it, desire it. I pray, Lord, show me yourself. Even me, I want to encounter you like my neighbors. Help me to come into your presence and want you. Help me to lift up and help me to go on my knees without being told to go on my knees because I just love you so much. Yeah. God loves zeal for him. Jesus said, zeal for your house has consumed me. Yeah, he was passionate for God. He didn't take people just doing things in the temple. He came and took a whip and he chased them out. He says, you, you can't turn my father's house into a market. He was zealous for God. 
But many of us, we have no zeal. We are too controlled. So look at your neighbor. Do they look like they're so self-controlled? They're emotionally stunted, spiritually. They don't know how to express themselves before God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't be a cold fish in your faith. Ask God to give you zeal so that you're not lukewarm for Him. Ask Him to help you enjoy reading the Word. Ask Him to help you enjoy prayer. Like pray, because God, God knows. He knows you're not like that. You're, you, it's like God help me because I want to become like that. And there's nobody who, it's not restricted. It's, only, it's not only some people who God allows to feel. He can help you if you want it. But you have to desire to be zealous for God. You have to desire to be zealous for God. It's interesting because in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, just jump to Hebrews 5, verse 7. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth. Let's read this together, by the way. It's a very important verse. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions. How did he offer them up? With fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was hard. Why? Because of his reverent submission. Oh, my God. Jesus cried with fervent cries and tears. That's how he cried. He wasn't like, oh, my Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> That's not Jesus. He cried before God. He was zealous. By the way, let me just tell you, this thing, when, I'm te when, I, when I tell you guys, unmute your mics and pray. There are some people who are like, I mean, I don't do those things. You don't understand. I'm trying to teach you. We're trying to teach you how to be zealous in your faith. We're trying to teach you how to have an expressive faith. Because you were not taught that growing up. We're trying to teach you how to cry out to God. We want you to hear other people crying out so you even understand. Even me, I can cry. You know, when we went to the prayer mountain last week, my God, I mean, there are people, <laughs> there are people who love God in this country. I, let me tell you, even now, thinking about it, I have tears. There's a woman who was next to she was crying. She cried. I just remember thinking, God, this woman needs you. She needs you. And I remember just thinking, God, I'm so hard. I feel like I have my life in control. I've never cried out like this woman is crying. You know, there's something important about hearing other people's desperation. It's so good for you. I realized that day I have such a hardened heart. I say, God, break my heart. Give me tears for you. I want to be broken about my sin. I don't want to be this self-controlled person who thinks I've got it, because I don't. I need you. Let me tell you, people, you need to be in a place where other people have fervor and zeal for God. Otherwise, you're going to be this calm, lukewarm Christian. And what does Jesus say? I will spit you out of my mouth. I will spit you out of your mouth. Be zealous for God. Tell your neighbor, be zealous for God. Be zealous for God, God's people. He wants you to be zealous. Growing in zeal is how we ensure we never become overconfident in our faith. Overconfident Christians have no zeal for God. They are confident in their knowledge. They know Bible verses. They know theology. And they are confident in those things and not in Jesus. Let me tell you, I'd rather be that poor widow. I'd rather be that, that poor tax collector who cried out, God have mercy on me then be that self-accomplished Pharisee who thought he knew God. Ah, Lord, give me zeal for you. Give me zeal for you. That's my prayer for myself. I hope you're praying it for yourself. Give me zeal for you, Lord. I want to be zealous for Jesus. The last thing. I, sorry, that woman, I just thought about her. She still, cry, she still breaks me up when I think about her. You know, that day, the day I went, these guys can tell you, I just went and stood near her. She was crying out to God. And I went and just stood out to her side crying out to God as well. I was like, I need her zeal to drive my zeal and to just help me pray. And sometimes that's what the 430 is. You may not have the zeal yourself, but somebody else's zeal carries out your zeal. Yeah. That's why I'm like, open your mouth and just begin to speak to God. Develop the idea. Develop the understanding that you can be zealous for God. You can shout out to God. There is no culture that is self-reserved. That's a lie. There's nobody who say, my culture, we don't shout. When I go to Germany and they tell me Germans are reserved, I say, when I watched the World Cup and Germany beat Brazil, they were not reserved. They were screaming and shouting and they, I could see mucus in their, in their... They were crying. They were jumping up and down. Germans were jumping up and down. No dignity. 
I said, you can do that for a little football, a, a little ball of leather that enters a goal. Surely, what can you do for the king of heaven? Yeah. Develop a zeal for God. There's no culture that can say we don't have zeal. Every culture was created to worship God. And then number six, resist the enemy. Resist the enemy. You know, it's important for you to understand as a Christian, the minute you become born again, there's a big target mark, a big X that is drawn on your chest. You become Satan's enemy. You become Satan's enemy. Satan detests you. He detests you with a passion. He doesn't detest you because you're so handsome. Because of anything in you, he detests you because of the Holy Spirit of God in you. And he knows that you have something that is greater than him that is inside you. And so you become his enemy. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 to 13. It tells us even though we're in this world, we have a struggle. It tells us we have a struggle. And the struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers. And against the authorities. And against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Understand God's people. The enemy is not your spouse. There's an enemy of your marriage. The enemy does not want a Christian marriage. And he will do everything to make you detest your spouse. And you think it's the spouse that's the enemy, but it's actually, there's an enemy. The enemy wants you to hate your discipleship group. He wants you to hate your church. He will do anything he can to take you down. Because we have a struggle. And it's not against flesh and blood. But it says against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces in, of, of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, even the enemy has a hierarchy. And that whole army, starting with the principalities all the way to the evil forces, they're arrayed against you. They're arrayed against you. We are counseled to understand that we must protect ourselves. Even though you're a child of God, you have a responsibility to put on the spiritual armor. The spiritual armor to keep you safe because you are in a battlefield. Never forget it, child of God. You are in a battlefield. You are in a battlefield. Now that information should not make you afraid. It should just make you well armed. You must never leave home without the armor. What is the armor? And Paul breaks it down. The book of Ephesians breaks it down. It tells us about the belt of truth. Hey, truth is so important. I am planning to, build, to do a series on this, by the way, later in the year. Because I think it's important that we understand the armor that God has called us to. But truth, I put on truth. I put on righteousness. I put on salvation. I put on the word of God. I put on the shoes, the readiness to spread his good news. I put on the faith, the shield of faith. And those things, the Bible tells me with those and prayer, I can take down the enemy. I can take down the enemy. But the, and the Bible says, resist the devil so he will flee from you. Resist the devil is not shouting at him. He's taking on the armor of God. Yeah, shouting will not help you. The sons of Sceva, you remember that story? They shouted at the devil. They were beaten up for their effort. So it's not, what you, it's not how you shout, in the name of Jesus. No, that's not what's going to make the devil run away from you. No. You need to know God's word. And you need to take up the armor of God. And the devil will flee from you as you resist him. Remember, the devil never takes a day off, by the way. Huh? He doesn't. So that's one of the things that wakes me up early in the morning. Because I'm, I'm like, I may be sleeping, but the devil ain't. Yeah? Yeah, he doesn't take a day off. But the good thing is God's word tells us we have authority and that unless we allow it, the enemy does not have any power over us. Can I say that again? As a child of God, you have authority and unless you allow it, the enemy has no power over you. The only way the enemy can have power over you is if you allow it because God has given you authority. 1 John 4, 4 says, Dear children, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You already have overcome just by virtue of having the Spirit in you. And your authority is not of your, because of your strength, but because of who you represent. And that's why James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Part of maturity as a Christian is understanding that God's word is more important than your thoughts or feelings. God's word is more important than your thoughts and feelings. The, the enemy is a, a, a master at manipulating thoughts. He's, a, he's called the father of lies. So he's a master of planting er erroneous thoughts in your mind. He will plant things that make you doubt God. He'll ask you questions like, did God really say? 
just like he did with Eve. He's a master manipulator. And that's why as God's people, we must know God's word. Because God's word is how we resist the devil. Jesus shows us how to do it. When, the, when Satan comes and says, please do this, he says, it is written. Did you notice Jesus never used logic, never used his own wisdom. He always said, it is written. And the minute he quoted God's word, Satan backed off. So you must know God's word. It's your responsibility to know God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. As soon as you recognize that thoughts are caused by spirits, my goodness, you'll be so far along the journey of being unshakable. Ah, uh ah, -uh, let me tell you. Any thought I've ever had that was fearful was not from God. Any fear, it's not from God. Because fear is not from God. The Bible says that God did not give us a spirit of fear. So whenever I feel in my stomach, my God, I'm afraid. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I already know. That's a demon. <laughs> that's a demonic thought. Because fear is an emotion that's manipulated by the, the demon of fear. And what do I do at that point? Take it captive. In the name of Jesus, fear, I bind you and I cast you away from this place. I belong to Jesus. I take authority over that thought. I make you captive to Jesus. And I receive the peace of God instead. By the way, there are many times I've just felt a lift. Like almost a visible, a tangible lift in my spirit. When I wake up and I feel oppressed, ah, that's not of God. Oppression is not of God. I speak to, the, to, the, to that spirit and I say, spirit of oppression, I bind you and I cast you away from this altar. This is God's place. There's no room for you here. Boom. Joy comes in. I speak to myself. I, I, say, I say to myself, the, the, spirit, the, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. Anything I'm not feeling, I'm feeling right now that is not consonant with these things, depart, depart, depart. Patience, kindness, goodness. By the way, you do spiritual warfare for yourself in the morning. Am I speaking to any males in the house? <laughs> and even you sanguines, you have your own issues. Yeah, you speak to yourself and bind those spirits. Take captive every thought. The Bible says not some thoughts, every thought must be obedient to Jesus Christ. Every thought that I have. And when you do that, whether it's discouragement or doubt or anxiety or temptation, when you do that, you've chosen, you choose to guard your mind against the deception of the enemy and choose to think the thoughts of God. Whatever is true, Philippians 4, 8, whatever is pure, whatever is, is right, whatever is noble, whatever is accept, uh, praiseworthy, all those things that are listed there, those are the kind of things we choose to think about. And so there you are, God's people. The Word of God tells you, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, ah, oh, come on somebody, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Come on, somebody, give glory to Jesus who's in the house. Amen. I want us to pray. I want us to just take a minute and pray as we conclude. Hey, anybody who knows, they know, knows how to stand firm now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing, nothing can. When you know these things, realize Satan can't move me. You know the book that in, 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 uh, is it? in the book of Romans when it talks about nothing can separate us from God's love height no depth nothing angels no demons no, no powers above or powers below nothing can shake you or separate you from God's love this is the place you are right now you understand the power and authority God has given you and because of that none of you will ever backslide none of you is going to grow cold in your faith none of you is ever going to become on the sideline of God's activity. You are going to have passion for God the rest of your life. Your business will be in the center of God's attention. Ah, God will be glorified through your family. Yeah. This is the kind of person you are. By the way, it has nothing. You will stand firm and nothing will move you. Whatever the enemy has planned for you, it is finished in Jesus' name. It has no authority over you because you know how to stand firm. Amen. I want to pray for all of us. And as I pray, first of all, I just want to hear, you can stand if you want. I want to pray for somebody who has been offended. I just sense that there are some people who today is the day that that offense leaves your life in Jesus' name, completely. Some of you have been offended in your church. Some of you have been offended by your pastor. Some of you have been offended by your husband, your spouse. 
And I believe right now God wants us to lay aside that offense completely, completely. And I want you to do a very sacred thing. If you're dealing with offense, you're in a place of bitterness, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. We're, going to, we're not going to take long with this, very briefly. But I just feel like by walking to the altar and trusting God together, letting go of that offense, today freedom is coming to this house. In fact, I believe there's going to be physical healing because of the release of this offense. So just come up, come up, come up, come up. Let's appreciate them as they come up.